2017. Start with the Pledge of Allegiance, if, if uh, Ms. Garfield would lead us. Next item on the agenda is a closed session. If our attorney will read yeah. us into. Yes, thank you, Chair and members of the board and public. Uh, item 3A, Public Employment Government Code Section 54959.7B, Executive Officer Evaluation. Yeah. Shall we go? Okay, everybody, thank you for coming back. And let's get back to order here. And uh, Mr. Giffen, if you could read us out of uh, closed session. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, members of the board and public. Uh, the board met in closed session on item 3A, uh, Public Employment Government Code Section 549597, uh, friend B, Executive Officer Evaluation. There's nothing to report out. Very good, thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Supervisor Parker. Here. Supervisor Adams. Here. Supervisor Phillips. Here. Mayor Edelin. Council Member O'Connell, Council Member Morton, Here. Council Member Smith, Here. Mayor Rubio, Here. Council Member Alexander, Here. Mayor Carbone, Here. Mayor Gunter, Here. Council Member Garfield, Here. Council Member Reimers, Here. Kathleen Lee, Senator Bill Monning, Here. Assembly Member Mark Stone, Here. Debbie Hale, Here. Dr. P.K. Diffenbaugh, Here. Steve Matarazzo, Andre Lewis, Here. Hugh Hardin, Here. Bill Collins, Here. Dr. Walter <laughs> Tribley, Dr. Thomas Moore. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. At this time, we'll go to acknowledgments, uh, announcements, and correspondence. Uh, Mr. Hulamard? Yes, uh, Chair and members of the board, I have a few announcements uh, for the board's uh, interest. First, uh, just an announcement about the uh, California Coastal Commission was visiting this week, taking some significant actions. Uh, they were hosted by California State University, Monterey Bay. I think Andre Lewis uh, hosted them all by himself. Is that right? <laughs> and uh, while the Coastal Commission was here in town, they did uh, take an action to approve the campground that the California State Parks has proposed for the Fort Ordun State Park. And so they will be moving ahead with that project. There was some significant debate about it, but I think with the work that uh, Mary Adams of our staff did, 
working with uh, state parks and other jurisdictions, both I think Marina and Seaside contributed comments that were beneficial. I know this is in the county of Monterey, and the county staff have also worked with state parks in this regard, but the campground was adopted and approved. So uh, that was a positive for Fort Ord this week. Uh, also, I'd like to remind everyone, last month we announced that the Fort Ord Environmental Cleanup Program of the BRAC office, along with the Fort Ord Reuse Authority, is uh, sponsoring a special community involvement mobile workshop uh, tomorrow. Uh, that's going to start at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. It's going to be right at the BRAC office, right off of Giggling. I think every... Hugh, are you going to participate in that tomorrow? <laughs> but it'll be a great opportunity for those of you that haven't had a chance to see this recently to get into some areas of the former Fort Ord that have been barred from public access because of the munitions removal. These are all properties that are going to be part of the, um, Euro the um, California Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management's Fort Ord National Monument as soon as the cleanup is completed, but this is an opportunity for members of the community to get a, a first-hand experience on what's being accomplished in that area of the base and to see some open space and habitat that uh, isn't normally uh, open for the public. Uh, I know that Eric uh, Morgan today passed out a um, munitions ha hazards advisory note that the National Conservation Lands Program has been distributing. So the board members, you have those here. And Eric, those are available for the public as well. Is that correct? Uh, just wanted to mention that. Uh, also, uh, an, an, a, another announcement that there is a for a board workshop focused uh, on focused on building removal on July 26th. The Fort Ord Executive Committee looked at the possibility of putting a board workshop together that was both transportation and building removal and after the staffs of TAMPS and FORA and our own staff working with CSU and B staff about the full scope of what we would do with the two of those, we realized there would not be enough time. And since there are several policy issues associated with building removal and because of vacations and time, we're going to fo focus this first workshop on building removal. And then hopefully um, we'll get a those MailChimp or those uh, Google tests or whatever it is to find out what the board member's availability is. But we're looking at uh, Doodle Poll. Is that what that Doodle Poll? Yeah. Doodle the more technically inclined know those things. Uh, but the Google poll will give us an idea whether July 31st, August 3rd, August 4th, I forgot, but I think those are the three options that we're working with uh, for a possible second workshop focused on transportation issues. So just last announcement, and then, uh, that's, I think that's all I have, Chair. Okay, then we'll move the agenda on to the, yes. Thank you. The question is, what are we doing to advertise this publicly? Will it be in the weekly as an ad? Will it be in the Herald? Something besides just your, we all get a reminder at the beginning of the week, thank you very much, about what's happening at Fora, but for the public to get it, what are we doing? We anticipated uh, getting distribution to all of our mailing lists and our Twitter site and our Facebook pages so that everybody would get that knowledge. And I think there's over 650 folks that are encompassed in that group alone. So it's email, Facebook, Twitter, all of those. We had not anticipated taking out an ad, but I'll talk with staff about the possibility of additional advertisement. Any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the 2017 legislative session. Uh, well, we'll start with our esteemed state senate district senator, Mr. Bill Monty. Yes, hey, well, thank chair. you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Appreciate the opportunity to join you this afternoon. Want to thank you all for your ongoing work, not only with Fora but your respective leadership positions throughout Monterey County. Um, Assembly Member Stone and I will do kind of a tag team today and. Uh, I'll start with some highlights of this legislative session. Uh, perhaps the biggest news is that we landed a balanced budget 
for the seventh year in a row on time uh, with the largest reserve the state's ever had, close to $10 billion in reserve accounts um, and the largest increase in the history of state public education for K through 14, K through 12 and community colleges, uh, about a $3 billion increase up to about $72 billion. So that's good news. It moves California up in the rankings, still not to the position we'd like to be, but we're over now $10,000 per student uh, per capita funding in California education system. So we're moving in the right direction um, and that budget has other, other key provisions. Um, perhaps for us one of the most significant components of the budget signed by the governor on June 27th was an allocation of 1.5 million dollars for our veterans cemetery uh, with the tremendous support of Assemblymember Stone in the Assembly, the leadership of both houses uh, and bipartisan support, we were able to incorporate that in the budget in the final stages of the budget process and then it moved to the governor and we did not publicize that because we had to make sure the governor was going to sign it and he did. Um, so that helps us meet the, the, the marker combined with community funding that's uh, in the bank which will qualify the veteran cemetery with the feds for the next phase build out for in ground burials. We'll meet the October 1st deadline. The pre-application has already been filed uh, and this funding will be used for design, uh, drawing and then with the federal money the build out of the in ground burial. So uh, it was a tremendous team effort and uh, I want to also acknowledge the ongoing leadership of veterans here, the support of FORA, the support of the City of Seaside, and all community partners who have kept this front and center uh, for us. And I'm sure uh, Mark will also want to add to that. Um, but I do want to publicly acknowledge uh, his partnership as we pursued that, as well as the staff in both of our offices. Um, we are on the verge of a vote probably on Monday on what's called the cap and trade extension. Uh, this is California's approach to reducing CO2 emissions. It would extend the cap and trade program to 2030 and based on the elements of a negotiated compromise that involves oil, manufacturing, environmental organizations, it keeps us on track to hit the legal standards that we've set through past legislation, SB 32, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 2030. Uh, and we will lead not only the nation, but many parts of the world in those achievements. The dynamic in these negotiations, there's always a question of, um, so by enforcing these very strict environmental standards, does that affect business? Well, we know that California and the renewable energy market has created 500,000 jobs in renewable energy, mostly in solar, but also wind and other forms of renewable energy. A half million jobs in the state of California. Nationally, in the fossil fuel industry, uh, or coal, coal industry, a total of 50,000 jobs. So we have 10 times as many jobs in California in renewable as nationally in, in coal mining production jobs. So it's, it's the wave of the future. The number one investment in the state right now of venture capital is in renewable energy. Uh, I also have Diablo Canyon, which is not in Monterey County, of course, but it is part of the 17th Senate District. PG&E has negotiated an agreement with local stakeholders, the unions, and uh, environmental groups to phase out um, and decommission Diablo over the next seven years and they will, that accounts for about 10% of our statewide energy portfolio, about 20% of PG&E's portfolio, and they will replace all of that with renewable energy. It'll be less expensive, it'll be safer, and it won't have the high cost of maintenance and operation of a high security facility like Diablo Canyon. So those are some of the markers that keep us moving forward in our economic recovery. I think the caution that Mark would agree and the governor is kind of his mantra, we're in our seventh or eighth year of economic recovery in this state. We've created more new jobs than Texas and Florida combined.
but if you look retrospectively, there's never been an economic recovery that lasted more than seven years in the state of California. So economies work in cycles. And so part of the governor's fiscal conservatism has been anticipating that it's not a question of whether, it's a question of when there will be an economic dip or hopefully not a drop. And that's why the reserves that we continue to contribute to are designed to help offset the impact uh, of an economic decline or drop. Uh, I should also mention in, in the area of higher education, both CSU and UC uh, benefit from increases in budgets, um, never as much as the recipients would like, but still better than a takeaway, right? Um, and I just you know applaud the uh, the inputs of CSU Monterey Bay and continuing to grow both student population and then with the acquisition of the building in Salinas truly having a, a countywide footprint. Um, I think I'll just close with it. I want to give a quick Highway 1 update um, because it affects the economy. I want to acknowledge the work of Supervisor Mary Adams and her team. Uh, all of the kind of unified command of all the agencies that have been working in um, Big Sur. And a lot of people think of the impact of the fires last year, storms this year, the loss of the Pfeiffer Bridge, the Mud Creek Slide, just massive impacts on, on the Big Sur coast and massive economic impacts. Many people think those economic impacts are centralized in Big Sur, but they affect Monterey Peninsula and Monterey County. They affect San Luis Obispo County because tourists who's, who are often attracted because they want to come to Big Sur, they think it's inaccessible, inaccessible, not available, and they cancel their travel plans altogether. So it's having a ripple effect um, into our economy. So I applaud Mary and Jane and John, all the board uh, in their stepping up to help develop and implement uh, the shuttle program. Uh, Congressman Panetta's office, Kathleen, have been tremendous in working with the community. Uh, we've had a really great partnership, I think, of local, state, and federal in trying to respond. We're reminded always Mother Nature has the ultimate power. And whatever planning we do, we can't prevent the fires. We can't prevent the... Uh, the rains and the floods that come. Uh, we can try to anticipate and better protect against. Um, I alluded to the cap and trade. Let me just return to that because there's a significant reform in there for Monterey County residents. There was something called the um, uh, state responsibility areas, the SRAs, that in a budget of, I think, four years ago, uh, the governor included an allocation uh, against certain rural property owners uh, to supplement our firefighting and fire suppression capacity. Um, it's about $165 a year, and many of those property owners are also playing into a, a local fire district. So the argument was, well, it's a double whammy. We're already paying into a local fire district, and now the state's sending us a bill for these state responsibility areas. And so these taxes or fees were allocated in rural areas based on fire risk and fire hazard uh, to help offset the CAL FIRE costs of aerial support, etc. In Monterey County, 65,000, uh, I'm sorry, in the 17th Senate District, so that's Monterey and Santa Cruz primarily, some in San Luis Obispo, 65,000 residents. Because of this cap and trade deal, we'll no longer get that bill in the mail, but the protection will still be funded using cap and trade revenues. And there's a clear nexus because preventing fires prevents one of the worst emission points of, of CO2 and particulates in, in wildfires. So uh, the residents will still get the protection, but they won't get that monthly bill in the mail. So that's a huge benefit for this region uh, with so many rural residents uh, there. And, and just to close back on the Highway 1, the bridge replacement, Pfeiffer, is on schedule. Uh, the shuttle system is being implemented. The businesses are surviving, but some better than others. Uh, the Mud Creek slide, they're still doing the diagnostics 
before it's even safe to put trucks or crews in there. Um, a third of a mile of highway covered uh, by the slide and so the question will be uh, does it get cleared and the highway rebuilt? Do they do a redesign of a more sustainable road like we did uh, with Pitkin's Curve and Rain Rocks with a uh, viaduct system that protects the road and anticipates future slide activity. But all of that a result of the rains and the water moving inside the mountains and pushing it out. Um, the only potential benefit of that slide is a potentially new surf break um, that I understand surfers are exploring right now uh, and are going to try to keep it secret as long as possible. Uh, my final comment, um, my staff, you all know uh, Nicole Charles, who's our point person on all issues for uh, and cemetery, uh, is my representative uh, at the transition task force meetings and I, I've followed that progress. I want to thank all of those that have been involved in envisioning and planning and designing how we all move forward um, given the sunset date that we're facing and, and weighing pros and cons of how we keep the base reuse plan implementation as our primary objective front and center as we move forward. Uh, so I think I'll stop there and, and turn to Assemblymember Stone. Glad to answer any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Assemblymember Stone, thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And of course, Senator, your district grew by about 13 acres. <laughs> so you're going to have to readjust your description of the, of the district and include that. I too want to thank you for your service. I've sat in my previous time on a number of regional boards. I know it's not always the easiest getting everybody together to decide on things, but it's it's very, very important and leadership at a regional level is sometimes some of the most significant things that we can do as local electeds in figuring out how regions interoperate and, and all the connections that are that are made. And I can't give enough credit to the million and a half dollars to Senator Monick. Sometimes we have to do things a little quietly, a little bit behind the scenes. We didn't want to draw any attention to this, even though it was negotiated into the deal, which was never certain. But the governor has his blue pencil, and he has the unilateral ability to strike things out in the budget, which he does from time to time, but he didn't do that this year. And being able to put together enough impetus between the Senate and the Assembly, I think, really shows how having legislators who can work well together and, and tag team and, and work both houses effectively gets us sometimes some singular advantage for the Central Coast on issues that I know are, are very, very important. And Senator Monning was key to proposing that, shepherding it, making sure that it was a, a serious part of the budget and serious enough that, that we were able to pull it off out of both houses and get the governor to not pay any more attention to it than he needed to and, and it ended up getting signed into the budget so that's a, that was really a very good thing. We also earlier in the year passed a really landmark transportation package for the state of California and I know that because it's raising some taxes for gasoline and for diesel that there is a lot of concern about that impact locally but yet in the notion of user pays, this is one of the first times we have done that, that those who are using the roads are going to pay on an ongoing basis for those roads. And as we've starved local jurisdictions over the years of the money to be able to do road infrastructure, this is a significant investment across California. And as those revenues come in and get distributed out to local jurisdictions, they don't go for the most part through the California Transportation Commission. They come directly to the jurisdictions and there will be a, a large benefit that everyone is going to see from that, especially in the counties like Monterey County and Santa Cruz County that have a large amount of county road, non-state roads that they have to keep track of in order to move farm equipment and tourists and everyone who wants to be able to come through our region that's money that will be well spent and, and directly spent. And I know the transportation agencies are just chomping at the bit to get those revenues and, and know exactly why, where they want to spend those. And keeping our 
region connected is very important and keeping people moving is very important and that's what the transportation package does. On a side note to the cap and trade conversation, the assembly had decided early in the year, this actually goes back a couple of years, that two of our highest priorities that we wanted to address were transportation and housing. And we had moved a number of measures unsuccessfully over the last couple of years to try and come up with an, a permanent source of revenue for affordable housing and address some of the questions around infill and how that happens. And when the governor came to us and said, we have to get cap and trade done, even though we had a tough slog with the two thirds vote for the transportation piece, in order to generate some appetite, we, we reminded him that assembly priority was housing and we were not going to be that receptive to moving on cap and trade, his priority and the Senate's priority, sorry, Senator, but without a, a real answer on housing. And fortunately, this is a partnership because two of the most significant bills are coming out of the Senate. There are a number of assembly bills. There were over 100 assembly bills this year to address housing. Of course, by now that's been whittled down significantly the way the process works. But we have to come up with some ongoing money on the table. When the state took redevelopment away a number of years ago, and I was on the county board at the time, and we really struggled with the loss of money that was able to be used directly for affordable housing, I think it's incumbent on the state to come up with a permanent source of funding and reliable revenue so that you can do what you need to do in each of your jurisdictions around housing. That is on the table. I don't know how it's all going to come together Monday. I don't think the housing pieces are quite as far as long as the, the cap and trade piece, which was essentially settled, although that's a little bit frustrating since we're not able to influence what that deal is at this point. But the housing pieces are there's a commitment from the governor and we need to make sure we have a similar commitment across the legislature for passing housing revenue sources and of course that also means two-thirds votes for those. So as a package going through and housing transportation also is very very much involved in the conversations about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and being responsible to our environmental environmental obligations across the state it all plays together, it needs to play together, and we need to make sure that we're working on solutions since we're at a time of varying leverages around cap and trade and housing and transportation. We need to be honest about everybody's agendas and making sure this is moving forward. So there are a number of pieces that will be a part of this. My staff is reviewing this. I've got a stack waiting for me when I get back to my office to go through in detail about what these housing uh, proposals are, one of which that came from the Senate is a housing bond, which is very needed, and another is a document transfer fee that we have the realtors across the state had been opposed to. They're now in favor of it because of some limitations that were put on it. So that has a reasonable chance of getting the two-thirds vote, I hope, and being able to then have money available to, to local jurisdictions. So we're working on some pretty large issues. On the cap and trade piece, some of us are a little more skeptical about the deal that was done and how much was given away to industry, especially to the oil industry, and whether or not there are promises currently being made on how we're going to be spending the greenhouse gas reduction funds. As I look at the numbers, I question how that pencils out. 60% of the greenhouse gas reduction funds are already promised to things like high-speed rail and, and some other pre-programmed policies, the programs that, that, that were put into place, there are between the fire fee backfill and some and a very large manufacturing tax rebate, that's another $400 million a year. And as these add up, there's less and less in the greenhouse gas reduction funds for us to be able to spend on the kinds of programs that they were was ultimately designed for. So we're trying to, I'm trying to get a handle on what exactly the promises have been made and that that's a significant piece of what this represents in the basic cap and trade along with the, the tax giveaways that were a part of getting votes doing policy is sausage making as they say and not always easy there also are an increased number of allowances which is giving the oil companies an additional billion dollars uh, over the life of the greenhouse gas reduction funds and whether that that all makes sense is things that we're, that we're trying to sort through between as we get between here and Monday. So a lot going on. 
Normally, the legislature takes a break, would have taken a break by now, right after the budget. We're still at it, which is interesting because I think everybody's a little bit punchy. <laughs> not, not having had any time off for quite some time and in the thick of some very serious negotiations and, and a lot of, of moving pieces. By the end of next week, we should be done with all of the policy committees. Then we'll take some time off and come back end of August and into early September for the last month's push to get everything wrapped up for this legislative year. So there's still a lot to be done, a lot of moving parts in the legislature. But we're on a pretty good track on the, the budget. The only thing that, that I will add is we have a local economist who I trust greatly, and that is Dr. Ochoa, who does talk about the, the, the slow ramp up of this economy. And yet we haven't gone, California hasn't gone more than about seven or eight years from a recovery to a downturn. But Dr. Ochoa says because of the way this recovery happens, he thinks it's natural that this one will extend a little bit longer there will be a downturn and we've been building reserves in the state to be able to protect against that. So hopefully we will not be impacting local jurisdictions to the extent as happened in the last downturn because we will have some buffers for that. That's, that's really good news. And this governor was in our caucus when we were talking about the transportation money and he, he said, ah, oh, you know, I'm fine. He'll be turning out here pretty soon. It's the next governor who's going to have the real economic challenges, the next ones, as will Senator Monning and I, as we're still be, we'll be in the legislature trying to work this through. So, so stay tuned. I think we have built in responsibly some significant buffers in the, in the state's coffers to be able to ameliorate some of the challenges that the next downturn will bring and, then, and not hit local jurisdictions, especially counties, quite as hard as they were hit in the last downturn. Uh, again, as always, no promises, but we've built in mechanisms to ensure that that, that that ride is not quite as bumpy as it has been. And whether it's transportation, whether it's housing, or just the way counties and cities need to do their day-to-day -day operations, hopefully that will run very smoothly. I look forward to any questions you may have, and thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you today. I'd like to thank you both for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be here with us today and in respect of your schedules and the time that uh, you have allotted for us, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, let the folks ask you any questions they may at this time. Any questions for either of our representatives? We got one here. I, I know both of you have been very supportive of the work that's been done with the Pure Water Project, and I, I know you've been very helpful with that. And it does look like our colleagues at Marina Coast Water District and Monterey One. Monterey One Water. Monterey, Monterey One, one Water. Um, as, as they're moving ahead, are still looking to coordinate with the state on the potential for supporting that. I noticed that there were several bills this year trying to get more funds into water resources. I also noticed there were a lot of bills that make way for affordable housing, and we get hammered weekly, if not daily, on folks looking for ways to do more affordable housing at Fort Ord. So I, I know you mentioned that, Mark. I know, Bill, you mentioned that, but, and your staffs are following this. But do, how do you see the future for funding for affordable housing and water resources? Well, I, I will point out, since you raised the water issue, this is probably the first time we've sat here and didn't mention water, uh, even though I know that that's a big issue here. But at the state level, things have been moving fairly smoothly along that. But apropos of the projects that are going on here, and again, where Monterey is kind of leading what's possible, that the state is really recognizing that we need to look at all potential sources of supply as actual sources of supply and this includes reclaimed water, storm water and often policies have been done in completely different arenas. Now thinking about how any water can become water supply, changing that's difficult and I think the Pure Water Monterey example including what's been going on, the reclaimed water down in Orange County and other places around are helping us change attitudes and perspectives among policymakers about what's really possible. It's one of the things that, that I think is exciting about that. And then on the housing piece that we we are looking to, I'm hoping to be successful on some, some real funds for affordable housing. 
address some of the restrictions on infill and things that, that we can then provide down to the local level so that housing can be built in an appropriate manner with a high level of affordability and be able to give local jurisdictions the flexibility that, that they need and the resources that they need to make sure those projects pencil out. Yeah, and I just add to that, starting on the affordable housing front, Mark alluded to two Senate bills that are now over in the Assembly, one by Senator Jim Bell, that's the um, affordable housing bond. Uh, it passed the Senate last year, did not make it through the Assembly, but uh, I think it's a different atmosphere right now. Um, and then also the Atkins bill, which puts a $75 fee on document transfers in real estate supported by California Association of Realtors uh, estimated to generate 200 to 400 million a year for support of affordable housing. Uh, we also last year in the Senate, uh, in the legislature passed a two billion dollar uh, homeless support for mentally ill homeless specifically for construction of housing for the dual status of mentally ill and homeless. And the way we tiered that was that communities like ours would not compete with cities like Los Angeles or the Bay Area. It's tiered based on population size. And while two billion is a lot of money, it was not a new tax. It was repurposing uh, Mental Health uh, Services Act money, much of which we found were sitting in county coffers and not being pushed out to support mental health programs. So uh, that's available money right now. Um, and again, it did not require any new taxes, but a repurposing. Uh, and it was the first time the state weighed in with funding for housing, for addressing homelessness. It's always been seen as a local issue, a local problem that the state has not ventured into. And this is a big step forward on the homeless front which is obviously tied to housing costs and housing prices. Uh, and we know a lot of people in the ranks of the homeless uh, don't suffer from a mental illness diagnosis. They suffer from an economy that doesn't allow them to buy in or sustain even rental prices. I was shocked to learn that in the Salinas School District, as many as 33% of children are, in, are homeless. They're from families that meet the definition of homeless because they're living in a vehicle, living with relatives in some form of temporary housing, which is, is rather shocking. So I think, as Mark said, uh, affordable housing is a high priority. Now there was a, the governor in last year's budget included a $400 million line item for affordable housing, but it included taking away certain local control in terms of planning, land use planning, uh, and review of those proposed housing uh, projects using the affordable housing need as as a rationale. We heard very strongly from CSAC, from League of Cities, uh, and the legislature really rejected that as a non-starter of, of stripping local control uh, as a condition. It would have been a one-time allocation, but it would have been an all-time uh, uh, limitation of those local powers. So that money did not come back into the budget but we think with these current Senate bills and as Mark mentioned other assembly bills there will be uh, a priority back in the budget. On water, um, I'm not as familiar with Water One. I look forward to learning more about it. We have been uh, big supporters of the uh, recycled and retreated water. Um, all of the uh, integrated efforts for recapture, reuse, etc. Uh, of course, following the ongoing challenges of desal and um, and the role of private versus public water conveyance. I will mention I have a bill that's made it through the Senate with bipartisan support. Uh, it's now in the Assembly. It's Senate Bill 623, and it looks at the roughly 1.5 to 2 million Californians who don't have access to clean, safe, affordable drinking water. You know, you turn on TV, you see Matt Damon, the actor in Africa, helping communities without potable water. And I said to my wife, why don't we get Matt Damon to come to California? Because in one of the richest states, if we were a nation, the sixth wealthiest, 
we have almost two million people without access to safe drinking water and affordable water. These are largely valley towns, but not exclusively. Many, uh, the result of nitrate contamination from agriculture, but again, not exclusively. My bill goes both to nitrates and to other contaminants. Chrome 6 affecting Watsonville, uh, arsenic, some naturally occurring contaminants. And our philosophy on this bill is that we need all Californians to come together to join hands and with a very de minimis contribution by all stakeholders, we can create a fund that will prioritize either new conveyances to these communities, treatment facilities, and most importantly for poor communities, the operation and management support. And it would be set up under the State Water Resources Board through the Treasurer's Office, a dedicated fund with guardrails that could never be pulled into the general fund, um, and it would provide certainty and predictability to provide the necessary support to get these families uh, safe drinking water. In Monterey County, uh, Chular, Rancho, uh, San Gerardo, um, other valley towns, I mentioned Watsonville. Uh, you look at a map of California, some people think, oh, this is just Central Valley. No, it's all over. It's in San Diego County. It's up in Del Norte County. It's all over. And sometimes the source is agriculture, but not always. So we have a working coalition includes Western Growers Association, the Rice Commission, uh, dairy uh, owners, dairy is part of the plan solution, uh, water districts, etc. And um, with that many stakeholders, there's a lot of different opinions about how we how we get to the finish line on this. But our philosophy is we've waited too long. We have an opportunity now with all these stakeholders at the table. It's a high priority for the governor. And I'd be glad to share further information with any of you that are interested. But we are going to be looking to water districts to join us with some de minimis dollar a month uh, fee. Over 66% of Californians say they would pay $1 to $2 a month if they knew it would help disadvantaged communities that don't have access to clean drinking water. So that's a priority bill for me this year. It's a bit, it, it will be, I'm quite sure, a two-year bill but we're pushing it hard right now. And with Mark's support in the assembly, I'm confident we will be successful. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Mr. Moore. So I hope this isn't a, a sandbag question, but uh, thank you very much to the state legislature and the governor for the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. It's certainly long overdue <coughs> and historic. As you know, there was a June 30th deadline for various eligible agencies to claim basins or sub-basins or portions of basins. Could you report out a little bit on progress? Are there many remaining of, I believe, 129 of the 515 or so defined basins in the state? Are there very many that remain unmanaged because they were unclaimed? Are there very many overlaps? And what's your level of happiness with progress so far uh, on the SIGMA legislation? I'll lead off, but probably with inadequate data that's as specific as your question. I would say the take-up has been tremendous statewide. People know they have to do it. In our county, there's been some discussion in Salinas Valley of some subdivisions and some posturing between water basins, and you're perhaps more familiar with that than I am. But overall, I'd say uh, communities know that this is necessary, even where there was resistance. It's our most precious resource in this state in having better groundwater management. And in our district, you know, when you read about the debates about um, the Delta and twin tunnels and conveyance from the north to the south and people saying LA is stealing Northern California's water, you know, we're really not the beneficiaries of any of that. We're totally dependent on our groundwater basins in Central California, with some exceptions. Santa Clara gets some from San Luis Reservoir. I think there's some areas in Pajaro that get some water conveyance. The prison in California Men's Colony is patched into the state system. But most everything we do, agriculture, drinking water for our homes, it's all based on our precious groundwater. So uh, Fran Pavley led that. Uh, and I think navigated and negotiated a fair and reasonable um, moving forward plan of 
studying, understanding, and measuring uh, our groundwater uh, basins and our reliance on them and our management of them. Nicole and I can get back to you with a specific question of your number. I just don't know. Mark may have further information on that. Not, not at that specific level. I think we've all been hearing about similar kinds of challenges around. And one of the reasons this passed, this was heavily negotiated, Sigma, the State Groundwater Management Act. And it got through the assembly on 41 votes, which is the minimum necessary. So there were a lot of protections, a lot of structure, I think, that most everyone here around the table would, would understand and might have agreed to that, that were just non-starters. So there's a lot of vagaries in there and a lot of things that were left up to locals to figure out with a threat that if you don't figure it out, then the state's going to come and step in and figure it out for you, which is the ultimate threat because nobody, I think including the senator and I, would ever want to suggest that the state come in and, and take over any of the groundwater basins or take over management. But because we, there was only so much we could do, that is leaving a lot of uncertainty and a lot of these sites that are just going to have to be sorted out amongst the locals. And I think that's one of the things that you're hitting your head against, it sounds like. I think that's somewhat common from what I hear throughout the state. There are similar challenges. But as far as numbers or specifics, I certainly don't have that. But yeah, we can, we can ask and, and provide that to you if you like. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you. Oh. So in response to that, when you talk about the bill got through 41 votes, et cetera, my assumption is that cleanup legislation is not even a viable opportunity. The only cleanup legislation I think we've seen were several attempts to, to completely gut it yeah. And, yeah, and, and repeal it. So no, taking anything a step further is probably a non-start in the legislature right now, especially until we see and learn from the experiences across the state and see if there are implementation issues, such as uh, Dr. Moore's bringing up, that we might be able to help. But to give more tools, unlikely at this point. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have a question, but I did just want to thank you both again uh, for the $1.5 million um, to help the Veterans Cemetery get to the next phase. It was very, very helpful, and um, I like your success and stealth. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and ask the public if they have any questions. I know you're here for them. Good afternoon. Yvonne Stone, County Commissioner, and Executive Director of the Fort Ord Environmental Justice Network. Um, my comments have to do with the fact that we have housing being built all over Fort Ord at the price of 600000 and over, and none of the local people that I know can afford this housing. The money is coming from somewhere. We also have a billion dollar ag industry. And we're talking about water, we're talking about nitrate, we're talking about contaminated water, which has been coming from Fort Ord as well, especially with the city of Seaside and Marina. We're talking about the fact that even when we were told by the governor not to use a lot of water and we obeyed, then Cal Water was, was given the right to raise our water rates because they said we did so good they lost money. So uh, what I'm trying to figure out is where are all the government dollars going that's coming into the state and there's an awful lot of government dollars. The only thing I can see that is really happening for local people is the fact that we can eat because the food bank is making sure that they have food available for for uh, the low-income communities. Uh, um, I just don't understand how all these years, the, especially the African-American community here has been greatly gentrified. Of course, we know that, and nobody likes to talk about it. 
but it's happening. Right now, there are several families having to leave the peninsula that's been here all their life because their rents have been raised three and four hundred dollars. And I have been bringing this to the attention of the policymakers, and nobody is addressing it. But everybody is slapping each other on the back for all of the progress that they're making uh, with the developments, uh, the commercial developments and everything else that's coming in that is not uh, bringing in adequate jobs for the low-income communities. There is something wrong with this process. And I know that people are working together and looking at what is happening, but they're not addressing the issues that the public are really concerned about, that we're really bringing forward. So I would just like to know what the next step is. We're talking about 20 years up the road here. We're talking about what happened to Big Sur, and it did happen. And I'm really glad to see this being addressed, but the situation here locally, the Fort Ord situation and the communities that have really been impacted around this um, base have not been addressed. Thank you, Mr. Stone. I'd also like to just thank you, Yvonne, for your continued community leadership. Um, I think as we've referenced, affordable housing is a current priority in the state legislature. Um, for us to move anything through, we require a minimum of a majority vote, more often a two-thirds vote when it involves uh, raising new funding for things like affordable housing. Uh, we have very narrow margins right now in both houses, and uh, we, we need to get those majority votes to be able to move money into communities. Uh, on the waterfront, uh, you made reference to Cal-Am with higher conservation in the community and, and yet rates going up. Um, as, a, as a shareholder owned company, they are under the uh, control and regulation of the Public Utilities Commission. There are ratepayer advocates who uh, routinely put forth the ratepayer uh, positions on these issues and uh, it's in the hands of the PUC, not of the state legislature. Uh, but again, I think probably unsatisfactory answers to your questions, but um, your continued advocacy and keeping it on the radar is the only way we're going to make any change. So thank you. More public comment? I'm Jan Schreiner, resident of Marina. I have three things I'd like to mention. One is thank you very much to Assemblymember Stone's office for supporting the uh, agreement of the city of Marina with the sand mine at Semex. It was a very interesting Coastal Commission meeting yesterday, and I just really appreciate the people who came to support the city of Marina there at the Coastal Commission, including we had a Monterey City Councilman and uh, a former mayor of Santa Cruz and uh, someone from uh, Assemblymember Stone's office. So thank you very much. There were many others, but I just can't remember everybody's names. The other thing I want to mention along the lines of the uh, previous speaker, um, as part of the Water Conservation Commission work that I do, I got to go to the East Garrison uh, Housing Development. That's a, that's a county approved housing development. A benchmark is the developer. And I understand uh, from news reports, strong sales. So I was very interested in their statistics. Uh, apparently 30% are owner occupied. There's quite a few other owners. They're not occupying those homes. So I, just, I think it's important everybody understands what we approve in this process for the community often is going to the global investor. And one of the things that I have been uh, sort of harping on as our local community strength is the bikeability and the nature. And one of the things that I picked up in the developer's office, the sales office, was this awesome map of East Garrison featuring the National Monument, a cyclist, nature facts, and this really cool map. It doesn't show all the rec trails, but the developers understand the value that we have here as a community. And this, I believe, is what our community needs to key off of. Like, don't just let the developers get all the value. We need to remember this and create awesome maps like this and draw business and people here. So I just wanted to mention that. And the other thing I want to mention is part of my um, 
Whew. California Native Plant Society work. I was invited to an, uh, what is it called, Association of Environmental Professionals meeting. It's now uh, Santa Clara County and Santa Cruz County and Monterey County all meeting together. They had a, a presentation on the water, the Sigma. They had a man from uh, Monterey County, Mike Novo, planner. They had a man from Santa Cruz County, John Fisher, planner. They had a man named Bassim from Santa Clara Valley Water District. Uh, it was pointed out by John Fisher that by creating an overlap, you are inviting the state in. You're inviting the state in. So we have invited the state in by having that overlap. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, Mike Nova seems kind of surprised. And the county has submitted a letter to the state saying that in any places where there's, uh, what do they call that, unmanaged, uh, then they would be willing to pick that up. So just so you know, the county of Monterey is offering to be the GSA for any areas that are unmanaged. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Mm -hmm. Any other public comment? Seeing none, we thank you again for joining us today and uh, enlightening us with uh, all the recent developments. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And for the record, uh, I supported the State Lands Commission agreement with CEMEX and the Coastal Commission decision yesterday and was represented at those meetings. But thank you for this opportunity and again thank you each and all for your continued leadership in our community. If your travels bring you to Sacramento, you have an open door, both of our offices. Let us know if you're coming though we can clean up for you. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, next, uh, next we'll have a report from the, the 20th Congressional District uh, by Kathleen Lee for Congressman Panetta. That's you. I'm going to be easy. Uh, with the chair and the board's indulgence, Mr. Panetta would like to do his presentation next month in person. Uh, he felt it was important to come here and directly address the board members and apologizes that he hasn't yet been able to make it. but. With his work schedule, it's often time when he's flying back to district. So we look forward to having him here on August 11th, and he'll do that report in person. Uh, suffice it to say, we've been fairly busy. It's been a unique year to be a, a freshman member of Congress, uh, <laughs> trying to be a diplomat. Uh, but exciting news for us this week, just briefly, we did have our first piece of legislation passed by the House, and that's our Clear Creek legislation involving the BLM. So we're excited about that. And then yesterday it was announced that Mr. Panetta uh, had a change of committee assignment, so he is now on the House Armed Services Committee, right. which is... Yeah. That's good. Yay! <laughs> that was great. So we look forward to working with Fora and all of our military installations here uh, as part of that. Um, it's exciting for us, too, because to our north, Representative Kana, and to our south, Representative Carbajal, are also members of Armed Services. So it's a unique opportunity for the Silicon Valley, the Monterey County area, and San Luis Obispo to all have representatives on HASC, so. Uh, not yet assigned. Well, thank you. Any uh, questions for Ms. Lee? Yes, Dr. Just, Dr. just one quick question. Now that he's on the Armed Forces Subcommittee, do you think he has any advisors who could give him some good advice? <laughs> <laughs> Opening, do you mean? Any, any other questions for Ms. Lee? Thank you. Uh, next we'll uh, go to the 20th, uh, the 30th State Assembly District, Johnny Hernandez for Ms. for um, Assembly, Assembly Member Ana Caviero. Great. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, uh, uh, members of the board. Um, I'm just here. I won't take up much of your time. I just want to talk a little bit about uh, housing as well. I'm glad they brought it up. And um, like they said, it is a priority at, up in the capital, um, especially for the member, um, specifically us here at the local level, our office, and uh, Assembly Member Caballero is working on AC11, also known as the California Middle Class Housing and Homeless Shelter Act, which um, in short is, uh, will allow California voters uh, the opportunity to decide if a quarter of a cent sales tax increase to the to address California's housing affordability is a priority. 
and I know what you're all thinking. Yay, increase taxes, right? <laughs> we know uh, we know it's it's never popular, but uh, the member believes that this is uh, the only way or one of the ways to attack the issue uh, head on. And um, just to give you, uh, I guess, a little bit of stats on this, uh, it is estimated by the Board of Equalization that if the if it is approved by the California voters, um, it would generate about uh, 1.9 billion dollars that would go towards uh, various different housing initiatives, including uh, financing for first-time home buyers, um, fund for housing developments, and shelter for homeless individuals, as well as various various other um, housing initiatives. Um, so, like they said, this this is just one of uh, many. Uh, acts or uh, proposals that have been made in order to address this crisis that uh, California is facing. Um, and we're strongly uh, encouraging everyone to, uh, I guess, support this bill and uh, the housing crisis. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy. Are there any, any questions for Mr. Hernandez? Um, just a, a brief comment yes. um, on the issue of, of housing and homeless. Um, one of the things that not everybody thinks about is the fact that um, that people are sleeping everywhere. And and I was out just the other day on um, the Beach Range Road Trail, and there seems to be um, some housing, or some people living on the trail now. And mm -hmm. I have actually not ever seen that before, or at least they were further back. And so, um, you know, we've we've gotten into the housing issue uh, indirectly as well on the transportation front. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that it's, uh, I just support the general efforts of the assemblywoman because um, otherwise what happens is then people don't support trails which serve mm -hmm. an important health, recreation, and transportation mm -hmm. function um, because they think they're going to be uh, where a lot of homeless people are going to be living. Right. So right. it's right. not a great place for them. It's not a great place for the trail users either. Right, exactly. Oh, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Car Carbone. ACA 11, yeah, it's an act. Uh, low, in t low to middle income, uh, yeah. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Thank you very much. Please thank the uh, assembly member for sending you uh, with the report. Right, of course, and thanks for having me here. Uh, next, a report from the 12th Senate District uh, for uh, Senator Anthony Canella, Reed Sanders. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to thank the board and the general public for allowing me to speak before you today. Uh, some of you might actually be wondering, Reed Sanders, 12th Senate District, what what is somebody from the 12th who represents all the way to the Modesto, down to the top of Fresno, all the way over Dinosaur Point, across to the 101 corridor through San Benito and Monterey County, doing an affordable reuse authority meeting? And while that would be a great question, I'd like to point out that due to the interesting uh, variances in the way our districts are often uh, drawn, uh, much of the 12th district that I represent as the manager of the Salinas uh, district office directly either abuts or somehow overlaps in some capacity your eastern and southern ends of Fort Ord. So if you haven't seen me before, I apologize. Uh, we out in the 12 are a very big believer in the casual, uh, approachable dress code. And, I, and on a particular, I take Casual Friday very seriously, as many of you know. So to that end, uh, I noticed that our esteemed Senator Bill Monning and Assemblyman Mark Stone have already left, unfortunately, because I was about to lavish them with praise for going over a the majority of my talking points in regards to transportation. So I will actually keep it quite short. Specifically, uh, SB1 was one of the main, uh, the main topics and legislative bills I'm in front of you to discuss. Uh, very, well, like as previously mentioned, most folks are not happy about gas taxes, but the need for road repair and growth is impossible to deny. And Senator Canella was uh, actually at great expense, was one of the main proponents in his party and advancing the uh, passage of this transportation funding. 
On that end in transportation funding, one other bill uh, of his authorship is Senate Bill 477. Now, that's an inner city rails corridor extension. To break it down quite simply, essentially it would authorize Caltrans and a JPA board to amend an interagency transfer agreement to extend inner city rail. So what the, essentially it would boil down and enhance the ability to get rail travel and more mass transit options all the way from the capital quarter to the south end of San Jose, possibly to the north end of San Luis Obispo County. So that at, at its current status, it uni unanimously passed the Assembly Committee on Local Government as of the 12th, which by my rough approximation was yesterday. One other uh, was a Senate resolution for Memorial Highway, particularly of interest to vets, uh, designating portions of State Route 183 and uh, U.S. Highway 101 in the County of Monterey, uh, dedicating them to portions for United States Army Chief Warrant Edward uh, Bailey Memorial Highway and U.S. Army Specialist Vilmar Galarza Hernandez Memorial. That's still, uh, that unanimously passed the Senate Committee on Transportation as of June 27th. Now, pertaining to Ford Ord specific acts, uh, uh, Senator Canella was an I vote for AB 97, Assembly Bill, Budgetary Act, providing $3.196 million for a new campground construction at the Ford Ord Dunes State Park. Beyond that, he is a continual proponent for transportation improvement in the region, specifically in the last two and a half years, very specifically, he's been a huge proponent of general fund uh, commitments to transportation, more importantly, and more interestingly to this area, aside from increasing tax, is his dedication to CEQA reform, a notion of if you have tax money, why not maximize its use by streamlining the processes with which to develop and maintain our roadways and highways. And uh, being that Senate Bill uh, 1 has already been very heavily discussed, I will end it there and open the floor to any questions you folks may have for me. Any questions for Mr. Sanders? Just I wanted to... I know the senators continue to be very supportive of the Central Coast Veterans Cemetery and have spent time being a strong advocate for veterans' issues over time. And I, I know the veterans here in the Monterey region have worked with his office quite often. And I, I know he, I, if Senator McBonning were still here, he would point that out. Thank you. Thank okay. you for your, the acknowledgement. I'm sure he appreciates that. And veterans and all issues relating to that sort are a huge uh, part of his heart. And uh, I thank you once again for your time. Are there any questions from the public? Looking at all of the traffic that's in the area now, and all of the traffic that will be in the area from um, people in San Francisco and San Jose and those places, and the accidents that are happening and the roads are jammed up, how, who's making these decisions about and talking about money to fix the roads? You can't fix the traffic and there's no more room to do anything with the traffic that's coming into the area and with how it's jammed up when people are trying to get from place to place. So uh, you said to you with tra the transportation division? No, no, I, uh, I manage his district office out of Salinas, which covers the western 12th section of his uh, senatorial district in the state legislature. Though he was formerly one of the co-chairs for the uh, uh, committee on Housing trans and House Transportation. So Senator Cannell has always kind of maintained an active interest and foothold in that. But I, I do thank you for your uh, for your question. And uh, it, it's hard to find anyone in the state of California who doesn't struggle with traffic. Uh, I mentioned that my office is based out of Salinas, California. I'm a resident of, of Hollister in San Benito. So fighting 101 traffic and that, that mass of folks coming down the 101 from San Francisco through the South Bay area is very much a struggle I'm familiar with. And, and, I, and I do note that there has been an uptick from my perspective in relative traffic mass and folks on the road. Unfortunately, uh, until we can make the population uh, either disappear or all float around in, in, in space cars, uh, effective use of transportation funding and planning is going to be the only tool that, that both the legislature and the general public have in government to address these traffic flow concerns. So. Well, I would like to meet with somebody concerning this traffic because the local people have less ways to get around and there's no other, there's no trains, there's uh, no other way for people to get around and they are trapped uh, where they are, the ones who are left here locally, 
and nothing is being done about it because everybody's excited about all the other stuff that's happening because they have investments in it. So as far as the local community, something's going to have to be done. So I'd like to meet with somebody because there are things that can be done and should be done. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll give you a card before I leave and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and thank you again. Thank you for having me. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and move the agenda on to the consent agenda, which consists of approved the June 9, 2017 meeting minutes, the Administrative Committee, B, C, Veterans Issues Advisory Committee, D, Water Wastewater Oversight Committee, E, Transition Task Force Update, F, Habitat Conservation Plan Update, G, Public Correspondence to the Board, H, Executive Officer Travel Report, I, Groundwater Sustainability, Sustainability Act draft letter. Uh, J, approved solicitation for on-call engineering and design master services contract. And K, prevailing wage legislative update. Is there anyone on the dais that would like to pull anything for further consideration? Ms. Garfield. H, are there any others? I, if you'd please pull I. I. I just, am I, my turn? Um, I just had a couple of questions with regard to K. Okay. It, just addressing what our practices are here at the board. Well, at then we'll just pull it for further consideration. Yes. And J. Life All right. is okay. So I will in entertain a motion for the remainder. Is there any, anyone in the public that would like to pull anything? Being pulled, thank you. Okay, I'll entertain a motion for the remainder. So second. Moved. And second. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item H. Use, use your mic. Mike. Oh, the light. That would help. Mike. Um, the reason I wanted to pull it was just to give an opportunity for a little bit of verbal commentary about a recent trip that we took to the um, Association of Defense Communities in Washington, D.C. Um, there is an agenda, there's a, it, a memorandum that's at each of your tables. And um, just wanted to start, I'll start off. Dennis Alexander, Mary Adams, and I were really privileged to be able to go to that conference. Can you pull the mic closer to you? There really, you go. We were really privileged to be able to go to this conference. And for me, it was a real eye opener. It was uh, this association is pulls together uh, communities that are like our surrounding communities that have been affected by base closures, but also communities that are active, uh, actively involved with the military installation, which also fits the bill for us. Um, and the biggest, con the biggest uh, conversation during this conference was about the Department of Defense's um, intent to start a new BRAC process. Um, and that was a big eye-opener. <laughs> um, but I did get an opportunity to find out how intertwined our economy, $1.4 billion is, to the military installations surrounding us. So wherever you live, whether you're actually proximate to a military base in Monterey County, you will be majorly affected. So um, there will be efforts going that all of our communities can engage in to really help support the continuing commitment to these military bases um, around us. Um, and the second thing I wanted to, to comment on was how much this FORA has helped other bases everywhere in the country. The legal agreements, the um, procedural aspects of how you transfer property from military to civilian oversight um, was apparently born here. And there were countless number of communities that came up to, in, to me and, and said, we couldn't have done it without this model. Um, so I just want to convey that that was um, a really good thing to hear and wanted to, to give um, Mr. Hulamard due kudos um, for the work that's gone on before I was even aware of it. So thank you. And I would ask if Dennis or Mary had a comment. Any other comments? Thank you. I'll just make it very brief. It really was terrific to have the opportunity to um, 
go to the meeting in Washington uh, on behalf of Fora. And uh, because Cynthia has covered things so well, I'll just make a couple of additional thoughts, and that is that the opportunities that I found in the relationship building, both among the four members who were there, but additionally the other members of the Monterey contingent who were present at the meeting, was very, very helpful. Um, it's always terrific when you have sort of personal time to get to interact with others. You just get a very different feeling, and you build up that sense of, of um, trust that I think is so important. Lots of presentations on BRAC, presentations on water. Um, I found it to be a very exciting um, opportunity because I enjoyed the uh, um, just the funding opportunities that were presented as well. And those casual conversations that you have with people and the exchange of business cards is really great. Um, I think Michael had asked for me to just give my overall like observation. And so I'll make it very light and tell you that one of the observations is that there is a lot of bling there. There were so many men and women walking around with big stars and all kinds of medals. So it's not a, it's not a, um, a place where I usually am, and it was sort of fun to be uh, in that atmosphere. I enjoyed it just very, very much. And then I also want to just say that it was really an honor. Michael was extremely hospitable throughout the entire time, and I, I thank you so much for all of your arrangements and your hospitality and kindness. But he, Michael, is really very well known at the national level and extremely well regarded. And I came away with that very clearly, and it was quite clear he was not paying the people to give the compliments <laughs> that we received. So we're well represented by Michael, and I just thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to attend the meeting. George Alexander. I'd agree with both my colleagues. It was a wonderful eye-opening experience uh, just to learn where uh, Fora sits in, in relation to all the other base, bases around the country that are represented by ADC. And I found that there were a lot of, even wh whether or not they are still active bases or not as active as they used to be, such as we are, that there are a lot of concerns that are the same. Um, Michael and staff, thank you very much. As, as Mary said, this, everything was well planned. I felt very, uh, very well taken care of. Um, and uh, the thing that I came away with was that even though our community our local jurisdictions and local nonprofits are integrating um, the military staff that are local in helping them become part of our communities as much as possible. There are still other opportunities, and I think we need to look for some of those opportunities, particularly through local 501c3s. There's a lot of opportunities yet to be uh, to be explored. But thank you. Any other comments on this item? Anything from the public? I'll entertain a motion. So moved. So the motion is second to approve the executive officer's travel report. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Item I. Uh, Mr. Hulamark. It's So I had pulled that. Um, uh, this was an item on our prior meeting. Um, after that meeting, several of uh, my constituents, um, well, let's put it this way. I think my rear end was kind of sore after they got done with me. Um, they didn't feel I had... Um, pushed hard enough on the item, and so they've asked me to pull it so that they would have an opportunity to address the four board on the, on the issue, so when you go to the public, I suspect you'll hear from some of them. Okay. Uh, any other comments from the board? Yes, if I may? Yeah. Yes. Um, as a follow-up to uh, board member Moore, at the last board meeting, I voted in support of the approach that's being taken today after the two uh, previous motions that failed, but as a member of this regional board, I believe that the MCWD's request for the endorsement by the board should not have been voted on without permitting MCWD to make the slide presentation that was requested by Dr. Moore. MCWD had received the approval of the forest staff to make the slide presentation. The slide pre presentation, in fact, was on the computer prior to and during the meeting. Dr. Moore's request was denied by the chair, who did not know at the time that the MCWD had received his approval. The denial of the request was based on opposing parties, the county and the Salinas Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency, not having their own slides to present. In my opinion, those reasons do not justify the denial of the presentation that was made in advance and was approved. As you may or may not realize, approximately 40% of this board has been on the board for less than a year or approximately one year. That was a golden opportunity to allow the board members to see a view that was being presented by the MCWD. One board member did 
last board meeting indicate that there was some frustration by people as to the lack of annexation of the Fort Hood community. I think there's a need to realize that one of the reasons it has not been annexed is because there's another entity that is in fact opposing the annexation by MCWD. And there was also a couple of board members that made reference to the fact that, alleged fact that the notice of intent by MCWD was to go beyond the four door boundaries. I think Dr. Moore pointed out that that in fact was not true and the slide presentation would have presented it. I, I bring this all up because I'm very, very concerned that too many people who are in the general public think that this is nothing more than a political body. And as a result, we're not getting the respect that I think we're entitled to. And I think we should always consider that when we're going to make a vote and make a vote on an issue that is so controversial as this one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Okay, comments from the public, please. And I promise I didn't coordinate at all with um, uh, Frank O'Connell on this. So I was listening intently to what he had to say. My name is Kathy Biala, and I'm a, a resident of Marina. I wish to make three observations on the last forum meeting. Uh, my comments are endorsed by other citizens who spoke at the last meeting, Michael Baer, Lisa Berkeley, Therese Collier, Paula Pillow, George Riley, Julie Hoffman, and Audra, Audra Walton. Um, first, the agenda item of the first of the draft groundwater sustainability act support letter regarding the ORD communities um, had been postponed and then postponed again. As a private citizen wishing to make public comment and having attended the first agendized meeting, I could not find the agenda item on the second postponed meeting. A four board member apparently had to advocate for it to be put back on the agenda. For citizens wishing to voice their concerns, such deterrence uh, render public comment even more difficult than it is. Secondly, a request to do a presentation about the topic at hand was properly submitted by a board member from MCWD and was approved by the four director. Other parties could have also requested presentation time, but none apparently did. In the discourse of whether this presentation should be allowed to proceed, a primary objection to this was the absence of slides by the opposing party for, uh, who had not previously requested any presentation time. The intent of the presentation was to correct misinformation about a complex topic. Lastly, when completely irrelevant comments from the fora leadership about multiple lawsuits against MCWD were purposely made to shape sentiments by misleading statements, this again loses public confidence in this board. My question is, what will this board do to prevent such commandeering of the meeting by a vocal few so that this type of meeting will not occur again in the future? I also request that Tom Moore be able to make his presentation on this important topic. I have attended a recent excellent presentation of both he and Keith Vandermotten, and I finally understand the issues related to Sigma and the GSAs. This body needs this same information. This board must ex execute its primary objectives of supporting what is best for the ORD communities. MCWD has exercised the most responsible and cost-effective water management, barring any complaints of service integrity of MCWD from the ORD communities. This board must tend to the welfare of the ORD communities by supporting protections from a MCWD GSA. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Yvonne Stone again, Fort Hood Environmental Justice Network. Um, some of those uh, those meetings uh, about respect for the public uh, or respect for the board, and it goes two ways. I was a, a member of the National Munitions Policy Dialogue uh, Group in uh, Washington, D.C., and I traveled there. Uh, for four years. I was also a part of the group that you're talking about, but I don't have travel funds now. And I heard somebody say that there are opportunities for nonprofit organization. I would really like to know what they are, because right here in this county, we are looked at as 
the watchdog group, but we are not important enough to be a part of, of the uh, participation in these processes. And I have to come to a meeting and stand up here for two or three minutes and speak or go to uh, whatever kind of meeting. But I never see those concerns and issues really addressed. And if we're talking about respect for the board, which is supposed to serve the public, just like all the city council meetings and everything else serve the public, they say. But when the public comes, they don't really want to hear from them. They don't really want to take any action. So this whole process needs to change. It needs to change for the benefit of the people that you're serving by sitting around the table. And I have been a part of many such uh, groups around this nation. And so, there you have it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Therese Kohler from East Garrison. And I attended the last forum meeting in June. And for a board, you are my representative on water issues. I'm part of the Ord community and I, as Kathy mentioned, I was disappointed when a slide presentation that had been prepared by Dr. Tom Moore of Marina Coast Water uh, regarding agenda item 8C, endorse MCWD as groundwater sustainability agency, was not allowed to be shown. And that subsequently the board voted against endorsing MCWD as, a, as our groundwater sustainability agency. My interest is specifically in the protection and stewardship of the underground aquifers in and around form, former Fort Ord lands and all of the water resources and water management practices that impact providing good quality water. Some of you may have seen this chart before. It's the chart showing MCW's uh, water rates compared to CalAM and others. And I can that's to pass around for those who haven't seen it before. The water rates that Marina Coast Water provides are very competitive in this area. Beyond pricing, we have been, we the customers, have been very satisfied with the services and the water resource management provided by MCWD for many years. We would like to see MCWD be endorsed, be endorsed by FORA as our groundwater sustainability agency. Therefore, I also request that Dr. Moore be allowed to share his slide presentation on this very complex issue at the next forum meeting, and that the board reconsider, reopen the GSA issue again. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, yeah, my name is Jan Schreiner. I serve on the Marine Coast Water District Board, but I'm speaking uh, as a resident. My, my comments are not authorized by the uh, Marina Coast Water District Board. I do want to offer a, a gratitude and um, support for Council Member O'Connell. I really appreciate his comments, and I do appreciate uh, Vice President Moore pulling this item so that everyone who wanted to can make a comment on it. Uh, in the last meeting, it did appear to me that California American was running the forum meeting. Uh, that was very disappointing to me. I work with a lot of college students and um, third graders, actually, and I mentioned to them it was very interesting to me as if um, the way this meeting was being run, if someone doesn't come prepared, no one who is prepared is allowed to show their work. So it would be like going to a class, and if uh, young George Smith hadn't completed his homework, no one in the class would be allowed to turn in their homework. It doesn't seem to be the best philosophy of running a meeting, of creating communication, of sharing information. And I believe that's what this um, body is about. Rather than hiding the facts, we want to share them. And in that regard, I spoke with Vice President Moore after the meeting. I said, you need to always have a plan B. You need to be able to, okay, I can't show my slides. Here are the handouts, just like the previous speaker gave you. Uh, you always need to have the highlights at least to make sure that everybody understands. I would suggest to Fort Ord uh, community that you have your new members have an orientation. 
It was even suggested in a Coastal Commission last uh, yesterday afternoon that they have a California American orientation for their new California Coastal Commission commissioners. So maybe Fora needs to have an Ord community orientation and a Calam orientation so that people understand what the phantom uh, forces are. I also believe uh, the Marina Coast Water District Board in the last Board of Directors meeting approved annexation paper unanimously, unanimously paperwork that shows a future study area. That part that was in conflict with another agency who is represented here on for, for a board, um, there's a sliver of conflict. And we have this genius general manager and uh, he works so well with people. He created this future study area to hopefully move the rest of the annexation process forward. And it was unanimously passed in the last Marine Coast Water District Board. So I just want to mention those things. Things are uh, taking place that you may or may not be aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? See, and I'll bring it back to the board. Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, uh, and if it's appropriate, maybe the authority council can give me a determination on this. I'd like to make a motion to continue this matter to the next meeting, board meeting, and at that time to give uh, MCWD the time prior to the vote to make the slide presentation that was previously on the uh, computer at the last meeting in July. Is that a motion? Excuse, excuse, yes, it is. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? Mr. Moore? I'd just like to verify I'd be more than happy to do that, and we would certainly welcome uh, any presentation that the Salinas Valley Basin Groundwater Sustainability Agency would care to make at the same meeting to give everyone the information and perspective of both sides on the issue. Very good. I would gladly amend the motion to include that, uh, what Dr. Moore just said. Okay. Yes, sir. I have no problem about listening to Dr. Moore. I always learn something when he when he gives a presentation. No, seriously. I mean, you're, you're very intelligent. Uh, I have no problem in delaying this for another month, but I don't like the idea. It's, it seems like we're going after the second bite at the apple. We had a long debate last time. Both sides debated. We didn't have the presentation, uh, but I think you, this chair, you made a, you made a leadership decision uh, based on trying to be fair. Uh, it was a gray area. I can see both sides of the issue, but I respect the fact that you took a, a tough stand in leadership role, and w people may or may not agree, but you'd be respected for doing that, being tough. Uh, again, I have no problem in doing this, and I'd, I'll vote for this motion, but next um, next month, I don't expect to resurrect the entire issue again and, and re-debate it. We get one bite at the apple on an issue, we've, we've, de de we've debated it, we've agreed unanimously that we would send out a letter that would not take one side or the other and just state our principles, and that's the way it stands. So if we want to go, if we want to go over this one more time, that's fine, and we may learn something. But I don't see resurrecting this. Or we could—it's already bad enough where it takes two months to get anything passed around here. If one person doesn't agree, now we're going to go two months, and then we're going to have another another vote in another month. It's getting ridiculous, and I, I don't want to delay it any further. Yeah. Yes. So. The distinction that I, the reason I seconded Frank O'Connell's motion is because it's not a second bite at the apple. The action in June was to try to give a letter of support that would support one of the GSAs to the state. And that apparently, I wasn't here, was defeated. What Frank's motion is about is going forward because two agencies have put in as a conflict is to ensure that all of the board directors here understand the roles of MCWD over Fora and Fora Water, and also to hear from the Salinas Valley group. So it's not a second bite at the apple because the deadline was June 23rd to send that letter to the state, is my recollection from May's board meeting, because if in fact there had been an action or a disagreement, we would have had to have a second meeting in June to make that deadline if there had been a split vote. We discussed that in May. So I want to verify that as a why it's not a second bite of the apple to my colleague. Ms. Ryan. 
just to clarify the second bite of the apple concept, uh, that would mean that that we would we would be this would be an information only a gathering information to allow those of us who are newer who may not understand all the complexities an opportunity to hear the presentation, but it would not be a reopening of the discussion to revolt because we did cover that in my judgment last time and we have a, a very fine representation of the principles that we wanted to share. So my understanding that sh is should I vote in favor of this would be for information only for a tutorial, if you will, for both sides to come to the table to gather more information, but not a revote or revisit. Well, actually, the motion as it stands is to continue this action, to not take action on this letter. Yes, in the, in the motion, basically when it comes back in August, my understanding would be it would be an information but an action item because we have to vote on the letter that was previously and unanimously approved. So I would think it would be information followed by the action vote on the letter. Well, and, th and that's where I have a problem because uh, this was approved unanimously by the board. So I think we should continue with the letter, but we can agendize an item uh, for the education of the board on the, the stand of uh, MCWD and uh, the Salinas Valley Water if I may, Folks. my understanding was that the last vote was unanimous to bring back to the board a letter for review and discussion as to the wording of the letter relating to the principles. It wasn't to actually, we did not actually form the letter at the last board meeting. So I would think it still is an opening for discussion as to the content of the letter which would take place in August. But, that, the, but the board did unanimously agree to take no position on who was going to be the water manager, but to present the principles. I, I believe the I believe that's a legal action. The, the action was, or the the action was to receive receive the report, and to have the letter come back in draft form to be reviewed. I believe. So Mr. Mr. You know, the, the as I remember it, it's the way you remember it. Basically, the board um, agreed unanimously to put forth the principles of the Florida Resource Authority. This letter puts forth the principles of the reuse authority. So I'd like to make a substitute motion that we approve the letter as written and that we bring back the uh, uh, for consideration, uh, for information at the next meeting, uh, Dr. Moore's uh, presentation uh, so we could be uh, brought up to, uh, up to speed on, on that information. Second. There's a motion and a second on the substitute motion. Is there a discussion? Is that limited to just Dr. Moore or, or, or anybody else? Is there any discussion from the, yes? So the distinction that I was trying to make is that when you were discussing this in June, the action item was for a letter to the State Water Resources, Resources Control Board endorsing one or the other of the two entities. And in fact, the board rejected that and came up with, we want to put forth a letter that sets forth our principles and I direct everybody's attention to page 39 of today's item is that this letter isn't to the state. This letter is to the two independent agencies. So you're not undoing what, you're, what you rejected doing. Your letter is what Mr. O'Connell's motion is trying to say is we want to look at those principles, make sure the principles are consistent with the presentation that the MCWD has given us that information, Salinas Valley Groundwater Agency, uh, Groundwater Sustainability Agency has given us, and then see if the content of this letter should be modified, adapted, made stronger, changed, whatever it is. That, it's a different act because it's addressed to a different entity. Are there any other comments? Ms. Carter. Thank you. I, I wanted to underscore what um, Ms. Reimer said about my recollection was also that that the principal issue that I remember voting on was that we weren't going to take sides, we weren't going to take a stand, and that, that this letter of principle served to make sure that our interests were set forth equally mm -hmm. to all parties, regardless of who it's addressed to, mm -hmm. um, and if it's not addressed to the proper entity. 
that these principles are the ones we want to stand behind, but, uh, but, that, but we've already settled the issue that we're not um, going to advocate for one party over another. Mm -hmm. And that's my recollection. So whatever somebody says in a motion, I would appreciate it if we could underscore that. Okay. So at this time, uh, uh, restate your motion. Just a minute. Uh, the motion is to uh, approve the letter that we have in our packet and then for next month to schedule Dr. Moore's presentation, other presentations, for example, the Salinas Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency, uh, to bring us uh, for information to bring us up to snuff on what's going on. Take a public comment. Any others? Yeah. If I'm to understand correctly, it sounds like the people coming into this community with their ideas and developments and whatever, it doesn't matter if the local public understands or buy into it or not. It's not It's not public comment time yet. I, th I thought he said public comment. You didn't say that? I'm sorry. I missed that. Sorry. Then, Good. Sorry uh, about that. I didn't oh, my hear goodness. That. It's Miss Stone or Evangelist Stone, sir. But uh, it sounds like uh, what I'm hearing is that it's not it's not important for the community that you're in to understand what you're doing and what your projects are and to buy into it or not to buy into it, but just to make the decisions that are being made around this table without our input and without us even knowing what you're talking about. I, I think that is, uh, that's ridiculous. This is the United States of America. We're supposed to have a process where our elected officials on any form all the way to the White House understands that they're working for the people that are voting them into office or that they're representing. If that's not the case, uh, I don't know what country we're in. Hi, <clears throat> Jan Schreiner, and I would like to try to remind the new members in particular, the difference in the population we're talking about, the Ord community, uh, recall, is about 18,000, and the maker of the motion, the substitute motion, represents about 1,000 people. The maker of the motion is not representing the community of Ord, it's representing Delray Oaks. So keep in mind, on the Ord community right now, the groundwater is managed by a planning trio for a Marina Coast Water District and the PCA, we call it the PCA, it's the Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency. Those are the people who are managing the groundwater now. If you do not take that side, if you do not take the side of the people who are currently managing the groundwater of the Ord community, you are passing that responsibility and authority to people who are people like, uh, right now it's Louis Calcagno, he lives in Moss Landing, uh, someone out of Salinas, that's uh, Mayor Gunther. And let's see, um, there's several ag representatives, four I believe, uh, Janet Brennan, she lives in uh, Carmel. So there really is no one at all from the Ord community on the Salinas Valley Groundwater Basin GSA Governing Board, there is no one. And so to not take sides to me, is sounding like you're not representing your org community, right? I mean, who who there can help them with the with the management of their groundwater? I mean, you would, you would turn us all over to the public microphone in that case. There's no one on the GSA governing board that you are trying not to take sides about. So please keep in mind the long history the current MOU that Fora has with Marina Coast Water District and the PCA and how that serves this community. And hopefully you think about your role in serving this community, serving the ORD, the rehabilitation of this property. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, Therese Kohler again from Fort ORD. And I just also wanted to underscore that it's a complex issue. I, as a uh, resident and homeowner in East Garrison, I cannot vote for anybody on Marina Coast 
Water Board of Directors. My understanding is that for many, many, many years, it's the responsibility of FORA, all you folks, to represent the water interests of people living on, at Fort Ord. And I would sincerely hope, I know we're all like busy and we gotta make decisions right away, but I would sincerely hope that we have this great resource um, who has his hands on a complex, it, complex issue that you would take the time to really understand that and put that into your brain cells before you made your final decision and don't decide ahead of time because of a vote that was taken a month ago with incomplete information. Thank you. My name is Kathy Biala, and I concur totally with what the two previous speakers have said. The gravity of this is astounding to me that that uh, we're debating whether FORA should have to exercise the kind of um, oversight over uh, Fort Ord communities that they've done for decades. So when we go back and have more information from um, Dr. Moore, I would hope that it's not just for informational, that we take the information and we attach it to some maybe action that we previously didn't consider because we weren't operating from the standpoint of the information that, that we could have had available. So I, I hope that, that it's not just informational. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board. And uh, the motion is to approve the letter as, as presented uh, and to Substitute motion. And to uh, part of that motion was to uh, have the informational in the next next month with whoever wants to present. Right. And actually, this letter is moot now because the state has already had its deadline. But it's addressed to the two uh, the two water management uh, agencies. So uh, at this point, we'll go ahead and uh, take the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Three no's. Okay, so that does not pass unanimously, so that'll have to come back at the next meeting. Um, raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> only one, Frank, only one. <laughs> no, he was assuming a position. <laughs> Okay, so uh, on the original motion, so that that passed, but it's not unanimous. So, what's the what's the deal? Do we have to go back to the first motion? Since yes. This, since the first motion was to bring it back next month, what, restate your motion. Yes, yes. On yours. That's that's the question I was asking. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, this is, no, third, go for a third. <laughs> okay, so. It'll come back next week, month for a second month. vote. Okay, it passed. Good. That's Not clear unanimous. as mud, thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair? <laughs> yes. I, I've got a question, I'm, I'm, I'm the new guy that's not here very often, but um, on, on the GSA, you mentioned something that the deadline is passed, so it's, it's kind for of. For the letter to the state. For the letter to the state. Um, so, um, by not taking a position, does uh, that action negatively or adversely impact the service provider of water for the community of Ward? No. Okay. The service of water to the community of Ward continues as it is now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's move on to uh, the next uh, consent agenda item, uh, item I. Approved solicitation phone call engineering and de design master services contract. So with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wonder if staff um, could help me with this. We um, at the executive committee we asked um, that it be clear in the solicitation documents that there was the possibility of uh, local firms uh, possibly doing parts of the on-call services, and I read the item, it, the, the language seems to be better, but I 
Um, I just want to make sure it, it didn't come across to me very clearly that uh, we were willing to look at uh, and consider that some of the proposers would do parts of sorry parts of the work, uh, not the entire uh, contract for services. So could you sh tell me where it is, where it's clear? Uh, my understanding is, as you were asking, uh, in what way we determine uh, who gets awarded the contract based on um, how we split the work up. Is that correct? Uh, my question actually was, where in the documents is it clear to people who might be bidding or proposing that they be one of the on-call services providers, where is it clear to them that they are not having to uh, promise to do the entire scope, but that they could pick uh, and choose? And the, the question that you had me asking is actually an interesting one, too, um, but I wasn't focused on that one. Okay, let me see if I can answer this best. If you look at page 44 of 73, which is page 2 of 4 for the request for quote, um, for the request for qualifications, um, at the last paragraph at the end of the page, it says, four anticipates that in some cases, the professional team proposed may be comprised of representation from a single firm or a firm with the appropriate required expertise drawn from the internal corporate resources, while in other cases, the professional team may be comprised of a prime consultant in a lead team member role with one or more firms as subconsultants to the lead consultant. What that means is um, if there is work that needs to happen on a geotechnical, um, then that geotechnical can be a sub. Um, if the work needs to be split out to, say, a uh, surveying group, that sub can be a surveying group. On the second component, the one that I thought you were asking, that has to do in the evaluation criteria. And the evaluation criteria is being used to determine uh, who gets ranked uh, of, of the top uh, responders. You'll see that we have a local hire preference, and the local hire preference um, gives points for um, uh, the amount of employees, including those employees who are in the sub um, subcontractors, um, and that will help determine um, what local entities do get hired um, and how many sub consultants we can split that work out to um, beneath the contract. Uh, thank you for that. And and that latter uh, piece that you were just talking about is that on page 48. At that list of selection criteria? Uh, it is on page, uh, oh, it looks like page 49. Okay. <laughs> it's blended in there, so I'm sure you'll find it. And then the explanation for that uh, provision is also um, on page uh, 51, page 4 or 5, uh, at the 11, uh, item 11, letters of certification for local preference. Um, because professional services aren't. Um, prevailing wage, it's difficult to monitor how much local is happening via the software programs. Right. So we ask for letters of certification instead. Great. Thank you. I appreciate you pointing out that language that makes it clear that people could uh, propose to be part of a team. So that I, it was in all of the material. It just didn't jump out at me. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions for staff? Yes. So I'm sorry, Peter. I didn't quite follow what you said. Said, or maybe I'm not understanding. In light of what's coming up as uh, 8K, where there's new legislation that everybody in the world is going to be held liable because we haven't sent forms in or responded, in these statement of qualifications, do we require proof that they've registered with the DEIR, the DIR, excuse me, Department of Industrial Relations as? Is that in this and I just can't see it? That is a term within the contract language, and it says if. DLIR registration is required, that they're responsible to do that. Typically, DLIR registration is for any labor that happens. And on a professional services contract, an engineer is not considered labor in that category. But the contract language actually calls out um, that they are required, if they utilize any labor, to be to notify DLIR with the PWC 100. It, it doesn't give you the exact. It just okay. says follow the law. OK. So, so that was my question because it, I initially thought it was for um, consulting, but then I see the words construction, uh, repair, maintenance, and it's yeah, $15,000, and we have to send this in. And so I was 
just wondering if it's a better practice for us in the solicitation of qualifications is that that be provided, the registration, proof of registration be provided as one of the qualifications. Which we need to, in light of the legislation, we've discussed this previously when the legislative piece came in front of us, is that there's ambiguity of when, and I'm stating this because it's questions, is that is ambiguity of when FORA might be a responsible agency. And what I'm asking for our staff to consider is can we change our processes so that the registration is one of the qualifications that must be provided if you're bidding on something that that comes in and that the PW100 be part of the contract piece that we look at when we're approving contracts. But things that would make it less susceptible that we missed when the Department of Industrial Relations says, no, 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 you're an overseeing agency or it's a public works project. So so it's a discussion. It's I don't expect an answer, but I'm suggesting some change in our procedure. This is an example of why. Um, just to clarify, there's the engineering side and then there's actual construction side. Right. The construction side's the side or the implementation side. Right. That's the side that needs the DLIR. This particular component is not. Absolutely required. understand. But All the right. description of the work that you're soliciting includes construction. It includes some of those things. So I don't know if this eight whoever bids is going to be full service from engineering all the way to oh, the see. plants in the ground versus it's an engineer and it's somebody else that's coming in on construction. I can't tell from the staff report. Quite simply, I can put in um, into the uh, bid instructions that they provide their DLIR number if they do plan on or proposing full services. We will whenever we are an awarding body, we will. Okay, any other questions for staff on this item? Any questions for the public? Of course. Prevailing wage, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I've been working on this for many years with the county, with the local jurisdictions. Where are the jobs, the livable wage jobs for people in our community? There should be a fund. And we should be a part of this process, the Florida Environmental Justice Network. There should be a fund for any a developer, contractor, whoever that comes into our community. There should be a fund that they need to pay into for training or whatever. We are on the ground with our communities. We know who needs jobs. We know the condition that our community is in. And to leave us out of the process is criminal. We need to be able to provide a living for the local people living here and not just for those coming into our community. Thank you. Any other public comment on the on call engineering? Bringing it back to the to the board. To the motion. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, prevailing wage legislative update. I, I know that this item was pulled because of the importance of the item. Uh, Sherry Damon is here to answer any questions, but I want to highlight the fact that um, I've been called by Department of Industrial Relations. I attended a conference uh, in Southern California where there was a great deal of of discussion about this issue. Uh, special districts and municipalities all throughout the state are, are wondering how all of these changes affect them. There's specific changes as it pertains to your maintenance crews and operations. Uh, they are now having to register that when they weren't in the past. There's a difference in the timing that gives you more time to file. However, if you don't file in that time period, the penalties are higher. Uh, there's an increase in the registration cost. There is an extraordinary uh, difference today than there was just a few months ago with this effect. Our staff, Robert Norris, uh, provided the board a rather incomprehensive background on this whole 
creation of new requirements in the state. The board chose to hire someone to provide help to the jurisdiction. Sherry continues to do that. We have some new publications that are beneficial that we'll share with all of the administrators as soon as we have those. We've also uh, requested that the Department of Industrial Relations provide some support to this community by having another workshop like they did when we requested, uh, I think that was a little over a year ago. So there, there's a lot of moving parts to this. It's a, an ongoing uh, risky conversation about when you are or are not an awarding body, when you have to file, what your obligations are as an entity if you don't require those that are contracting with you to, to make provide their filing and so forth. So if, if there's a specific question, Sherry can answer that, but this is news that we thought the board members should be aware of. So I understand from when this legislative piece came before it was adopted that there was a lot of ambiguity and concern. And so on page 66 of our staff report, there's highlighted a language that I was trying to make sure what that meant is it, sa it says it somehow it applies to a jurisdiction public agencies who have approved or will approve projects on the Ford or to comply with the new rules subject to penalties, meaning FORA could have to pay. My question is, does that mean if FORA did, makes a de consistency determination or somehow is that Im interpreted under this new law, which I understand there's no, it's ambiguous at this point, but I'm pointing out that that could in fact be considered an approval that would be within the subject of penalties. So again, the reason I pulled this item was for staff to take a look at this and to consider how built up in the front of the project, both when we're asking for qualifications, both when contracts come to the board for approval or if they're approved by staff, both, that right with that contract is the PW100 and whether or not if something's coming to us for a consistency determination, if these additional reporting facts and registration should be part of the package submitted by a jurisdiction to FORA to make sure that we know compliance has occurred and we're not complicit in the oversight and somehow even um, that they try to chase money out of us as opposed to we've done everything within our power. So I'm just asking our legal staff, our, our staff to protect us because it does appear to be so ambiguous. So I don't know that I have any question you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to try to answer that question. I think the, the no, no, I think it's a very valid observation and this language is in this board report to highlight the ambiguity of the new legislation and that currently FORA and its member jurisdictions have enjoyed a certain insulation from the public works and the application of some of the new rules that SB 854 imposed when it started changing the definitions of what the definition of a public work was and ex changing that as it applies to Ford Ord projects. And so I think it's a very valid observation and a good one that I hadn't really thought about too much is the consistency um, determinations and how that might implicate FORA. The, the implication for the jurisdiction is a little more clear in my mind because the jurisdictions are the ones that are approving the projects. They're the ones that are approving the development agreements many times. Development agreements normally uh, include the provisions, comply with the master resolution, comply with our public works laws, prevailing wage rules, et cetera. And so that's a really clear, kind of a clear thing that I can see the DIR might say, oh, well, they are doing a public work on behalf of this city or the county. And it's not too much of a legal stretch to see they might want to extend the long arm of a penalty somewhere where they think they might be able to get it. and But I do think that consistency of determination, I will take a much closer look at that to make sure that, and I do this routinely, that, that FORA and the jurisdictions both have as much up-to-date information as we possibly can 
about this issue and that we're insulated as much as we possibly can to minimize our overall risk. Thank you. And I thank Bora for bringing this to all of our attention. And as a council member at City of Marina, I will be bringing this with the same kind of direction that we need to change how we do business to insulate ourselves from what now can be very hefty penalties. So thank you. And I'll Please. move approval of, I, we're just oh. getting this as information, but I wanted to have, oh, I'm if, sorry. If, if, right. if I could, Chair, just really, yeah, sure. we, um, we are very concerned about the actions and how they're characterized. You know, there are certain developers, Shea Homes, for example, indicated they have a belief that FORA's requirement for prevailing wage isn't the same as the DIR's requirement for prevailing wage. And if FORA were to be in a position because of new language with the consistency determination being an awarding body, that would completely conflict with the opinions they've been uh, I suggesting. I have no idea. And yeah. so, so there's, there's all these new changes. Yeah. And um, so, Chair, I don't, we haven't gone to the public yet, but there's a motion. No, I'm just playing chair. Um, so I, I think my, so, so you had questions. Did anyone else have questions on this item? Any other board members? And do I understand, um, uh, Ms. Morton, that you made a motion to? A Great. Staff has your direction. Great. All right, there's a motion and a second. Before we take a vote, uh, we should probably see if any member of the public has a comment on this item. Very simple for us, for the community, it's very simple. And that's the fact that we need, I'll say it again, companies, contractors, whoever, they come into our community to provide adequate paying jobs for our local community. Our young people have nowhere to go, nothing to do, can hardly sustain themselves uh, working at McDonald's and, and all the fast food restaurants. We have the competition from the students at the university who is buying up property left and right. There needs to be some kind of balance here. And that's what we're requesting, and that's what should be required. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment at this time? Okay, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, business items. Uh, Michael, building removal. Yes, this, uh, Stan Cook will handle this report. This is uh, a couple of items that we feel we need to uh, make sure that this is our regular quarterly report and there's a request to move ahead with uh, action on surplus two. There will be a workshop to give more detail on other policy questions on the 26th. The workshop was intended not to be an action item, but rather a workshop just to look at the background, the history, look at some uh, potential options for policies in the future, but not an action or action. This particular one is uh, solely related to receiving a quarterly report and allowing us to move ahead on the project you've already authorized, which is the completion of the work in surplus two for building room. So uh, it, it would hold us up a month or more to get that work done. We have some operating agreements with City of Seaside about fencing, about maintenance and project that's moving at uh, that site. So I don't, I would, uh, Seaside might request <laughs> moving faster than we have. Yes. So I, I'm just trying to get clarification. So item 9A1 is received the quarterly report right. and to uh, Director Adams' point is that to receive the quarterly report would be part of the overall report that we would be analyzing on the 26th. Item, can we take item 9A2 
regarding going forward with surplus two contracts today without receiving the quarterly report because the audience is going to be much bigger on the 26th, but it's already a, it's always already an approved, you're just trying to move forward on the contract. So that, do I need to make a motion to ask that we continue no, the think, building removal? I think for removal? the interest of time, that's probably better if Thank we're going to get through the remainder of the business. Does it budget. need a motion, though, okay. to continue the, your report? I'm sorry, you have to wear a tie another day. Um, does it need a motion or it's, can we just It's, it's to it? incorporate the quarterly report in the workshop. Yes. Uh, with, yeah, I'm thinking you need a motion. <laughs> and the other one, yeah. And then move to item 9A, small Roman numeral 2. Yes. Okay. So, authorize the executive officer to solicit and execute surplus two contracts. Mike. All right. What I'd like to point out to you about... <coughs> um, Item 9AII, authorizing the executive offer to solicit and execute surplus two contracts. The amount uh, has already been budgeted for this. It's already been funded. The obligation was approved by the board. The contracts will be reviewed and approved by four council before they're executed. Significant savings are anticipated using this approach based on experiences we had with uh, experiences at CSUMB had with their building removal. The idea is that if we can save money, uh, we can take more buildings down with the same amount of money. Um, the structure of this supports, the structure of this series of uh, bids here supports small and local business participation. Smaller uh, um, contracts mean locals can participate a little easier. Uh, the structure also streamlines the use of board and staff time and resources to get this uh, project underway. Keep it underway, excuse me. Questions for staff? Any questions from the public? Bring it back. So I'll move that we authorize the executive officer to solicit and execute surplus two contracts with the additional provisions that we just discussed about qualifications and public works project. Is there a second? There's a motion and a second for item 9A, small, two small eyes. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> item 9B, environmental services cooperative agreement. Yes, ma'am. Was it decided that we would, 9A or I, would be moved to the next meeting? Yeah, to the workshop. To the workshop. Um, yes, I, I, there, without discussion or vote, we're just going to be doing that. It's just being done. Did we didn't take a motion or discuss it. And I'm just, you, you, my question simply is, is that going to slow down anything? Because it seems to me that this process has been thought out by the executive board and, and it's been put to something that's already in play going forward and I'm questioning the need to delay it, if the, it is a delay or not. That's the, my question. The report is, is just a quarterly report that's delivered to the board on it's the, a status on the report, status report okay. of, of those projects. So the fact that we've just uh, authorized the, the uh, 9AII moves the project forward then. Yes, okay. Thank yes you. it does. Thank you for clarification. And I will be at the workshop, and we already planned in incorporating the information in this in that workshop. So, and I will wear a tie <laughs> for a while. Okay. So, uh, 9B uh, received their quarterly report on the ESCA. Mr. Cook. <clears throat> okay. Um, the ESCA report, of course, provides the background. It provides a discussion. There's a couple things I'd like to highlight. In the past, uh, when we were providing accounting for uh, the board on the drawdown of funds from the commutation account, uh, we had two columns in here, and that was um, uh, the 2014 revised allocations. Those are the monies that we were given. Then accrued through March, uh, accrued through, and then this one will be for March 2017. Uh, those are the drawdown on the commutation account uh, funds and the funds that for holds for admin funds and to reimburse the regulators. 
So that will continue. I've added another column here, which is because the commutation account has been exhausted uh, by, a uh, by Arcadis, uh, AIG is now paying under that insurance policy that this board was smart enough and the Army and EPA and DTSC to, uh, to require that now that AIG is paying, and this is the amount on the right-hand side, the $1,526,003 is the latest invoice that Arcadis presented to AIG under that account. Okay. Um, so that, that's how I'm going to continue to track this uh, so that we can see what's, com what's coming out of the commutation account and what it, I mean, not the commutation, what's in the remaining ESC original funds and what's coming out of the uh, insurance policies. Um, we've asked for a, a grant amendment from the U.S. Army to cover some for administrative costs because of additional work that was outside of the ESCA requested by um, DTSC and some time delays that were caused uh, over the years between EPA and the Army trying to discuss requirements that we needed to follow. Um, so we've asked for that. We've also asked for funding uh, for long-term obligations. Currently, uh, or recently, uh, four board members that went to Washington, D.C., and Michael Hulamart uh, met with the uh, Army BRAC headquarters, and they have been pushing that grant amendment forward. Um, let's see. The grant also pays for uh, request grant request amendment also pays for long-term obligations such as long-term management of ESCA properties, land use controls of uh, land use controls on ESCA properties, and post-closure MEC fine assessments. That would actually provide for management, uh, a management system and process to support jurisdictions as they implement and comply with the land use controls and reporting for ESCA properties. So currently where it stands is that the Grant amendment, uh, we are waiting, all parties, the Army and FORA, for that grant amendment to be reviewed by the government and come up with an independent government estimate to compare to our request. Um, what we're asking for is when <laughs> that is done, completed, that you authorize uh, the executive officer to accept a grant amendment if proposed. Questions? I'd like to just add a couple of things. Dan talked about the fact that we've had a number of meetings with our colleagues in the United States Army on this particular request. Uh, the first of those occurred last year when the United States Army brought its team out here and met with several uh, representatives from the jurisdictions that are affected by the ESCA contract. Uh, further, uh, this last January, we specifically went to Washington, D.C. to negotiate terms and conditions of an additional approximately $10 million to pay for costs associated with completing ESCA management for a 10-year period starting now, mm -hmm. um, roughly early next year, to be more precise. Yes. And uh, we also visited uh, Supervisor Adams, uh, Council Member from the Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Dennis Alexander from Seaside, and uh, Cynthia Garfield met with uh, Tom Letterly, who is the National BRAC Chief who negotiates these terms and conditions. Uh, on this same issue, and uh, we are very close to having an actual number. That number probably will be coordinated through Congressman Panetta's office. Um, that's uh, something that's negotiated between the United States Army Corps of Engineers and us. Right now, we believe our numbers are not necessarily empirical, but pretty close to the exact dollars uh, based on what was already approved by the Army as what they would pay for. Uh, but we have to wait for this inter intergover intergovernmental estimate that tells us exactly how they see. So if there is a difference between their numbers and ours, we'll have to negotiate those final numbers. I need authorization to say, okay, that's the right number. So that's basically what we're asking for today. Any questions? Any questions from the public or comments? 
Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. Second. There's a motion and a second to approve. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we'll open up to the public comment period. Jen Schreiner, I'd like to make uh, just a brief comment on the groundwater sustainability plans that are going to next be developed you know, by uh, 2020 and 2022. The ones to be developed by 2020 are the groundwater sustainability plans of uh, uh, critically overdrafted basins, which there are sub-basins of the Salinas Valley groundwater basin involved. And so those plans are going to be made by high-level staff, right? General managers, city managers, attorneys. It doesn't involve operations and maintenance or customer service staff whatsoever. Uh, but in this particular area, a groundwater sustainability plan can include capital improvement projects, pumping reports, pumping restrictions, pumping fees. And so I want you to really key in on that. These are not to apply to federal lands or adjudicated basins. But for your own community, when it comes to planning, instead of for being a part of it, you might be looking at a different body, being the planner. Pumping restrictions. I just want you to, to really look into your uh, groundwater sustainability plan and really understand the deeper issues that are at stake. The publicly owned water in our area, which I feel Marina is so blessed, uh, we have an MOU with not only the PCA for a, and, and um, uh, Marina Coast Water District for planning for old water. There's also an MOU with PCA Water Management District, which is Monterey Peninsula Water Management District, for the Pure Water Monterey Project. Public water agencies are working collaboratively in this area. So I just want you to think about that too and be aware of the antagonism by a corporation that has a monopoly on a community resource that is a necessity. And you have strategies for relieving yourself of some of that pressure and includes a potential initiative of 2018 that you could possibly endorse toward the study of publicly owned water for the Monterey Peninsula region. So I think that's really important to consider because we had a number of electeds in the past for this thing called Measure O that opposed publicly owned water study who over half are retired or have not been reelected. Half of the voters supported that initiative but clearly from the subsequent elections, the half that supported publicly owned water was very active in campaigns, right? Thank so you. So hopefully keep that in mind. Any other public comment? Members of the board, Doug Yount uh, with Marina Community Partners, developer for the Dunes Project, just a Reminder in future discussions relative to building removal that uh, there is currently still an outstanding amount due to the Dunes project for in, the, in roughly about $4.7 million in outstanding uh, amounts for reimbursement for uh, deconstruction that has been done on the base and in the project. Uh, so those are still outstanding, just something to remember when you're going through your uh, understanding and discussions of building removal. Thank you. Any others? Any, any, any items from members? Any items from members? Okay, we stand adjourned then. Thank you.